First Thessalonians, chapter 5. First Thessalonians, chapter 5. You know, one of the, the hardest things that we have to confront in this world as Christians is for us to be always content. Content. And that is when we accept God's sovereignty, God's will in our lives. Because uh, sometimes we want something and probably it's not something that is priority in life. Because, you know, the Bible tells us that our priority should be the things of God, the things from above, spiritual things. And sometimes our priority in order to be content are things from this world. Things from this world. And uh, you see, the things from this world most likely it's going to be sometimes difficult, sometimes impossible to get them. And if I cannot have what I want from the things of this world, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to be content. I'm not going to be happy. I'm not going to experience, experience spiritual joy, satisfaction, contentment. But when our priority is the things of God, then they are the main source for contentment, the main source for uh, happiness and spiritual joy. That's why we should always wrestle with that struggle. It's a spiritual struggle. And uh, we should always have the things of God as our number one priority. That's why, you know, I always keep insisting, uh, you know, cultivate. Cultivate your spiritual life. Cultivate your life with a devotional life. Okay? Don't be content with just coming to church. You see, that's very important because uh, there's uh, a blessing here from the Lord for you, especially. But uh, as you go out, go out and live it out. Be obedient. Do it. Do it. And have the Lord as your main source of contentment. Okay? Now, here we're going through this uh, passage on 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. And we already covered uh, some of the verses last week. And we're doing the, the comparison, the contrast between believers and unbelievers. And you see, that's one of the, mm, should be one of the, the com comparing a, a believer and an unbeliever that we believers we have God's joy we are content we are supposed to be content we're supposed to have uh, the joy of the Lord okay that's why it's called the joy of the Lord because it comes from him not from the things of this world while the unbelievers Everything has to come from the world, from circumstances in this life, in order to make them happy, content. But for the believer, it shouldn't be that way. Okay? It shouldn't be that way, because we are believers. And a great, great difference is that we are saved, and they are not saved. Which one? It, it's on? Oh, it turned off. Let me see. Probably battery is not on. Okay, we're going to have to change this. This is the, the YouTube uh, microphone. Okay, is, 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 do you have another one? Or are you going to charge it?
see the, the signal? Yes. It's okay? All right, thank you. All right, so let's continue with this. Uh, and uh, I was telling you the, the big difference that we should always be aware. The Bible says he came to his own people and even they rejected him. But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. You see, we have we experienced something great, the new birth. That's a, it's a big difference for the unbelievers. You see, they keep rejecting Jesus. You used to reject the things of God, okay? God himself. But now you believe in Jesus, you receive Jesus. Jesus, so now you became a child of God. Isn't that a big difference? Amen. So, because because you saw the, the, the richness of what Jesus was offering to you, you see those the spiritual riches that you said, oh, I'd rather have Jesus than the things of this world. That's what I said. That's why I gave my life to Christ, because I was up to here with the things of this world, that the things of this world did not satisfy. But that don't ever forget that experience of exchanging the things of this world for the things of God. And continue every day, every day, every day. Seeking for the things of God. Always of the things of God, the things of God. And don't fall into, back to the things of this world. Oh, well, yeah, now I'm, I'm a Christian. Now I'm saved. I know that I'm going to heaven. So now I'm going to, I'm not using drugs. Or I'm not doing this. I'm already doing, living a, a, a wholesome life. So now I can focus on the things of this world. No. The Bible tells us that, that we were clean to go back to the mud. No, we were clean so that we can serve the Lord, worship the Lord, focus on the things of God. See, so, so that's huge differences. That's why the Apostle Paul um, is con giving a, a contrast, a, a comparison. We're going to be reading from verse 1, chapter 5. And as we read, pay attention to how the Apostle Paul is giving us the, the comparison. He's telling, well, this is a bit different from this. You are, you are this kind of people, you're not this kind of people. You are this kind of people, but not this kind of people. Let's begin in verse 1 and notice, okay? Now, brothers and sisters... About times and days we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You're all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober for those who sleep Sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. So we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful message that you gave us through the Apostle Paul. 
Help us, Lord, to receive what you have for us. We want to learn from you, Lord. May your Holy Spirit apply your word into our hearts, into our minds, and uh, our will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so last week we, uh, we were able to cover two comparisons, two contrasts. The first one that we covered, it was from verse 1 and 2 where it says, For you know very well. Okay? So this is a big difference between us and non-believers. That we know very well. You know very well about the future things, what's, what's going to come. You see, because remember the context. The Thessalonians, they didn't know first exactly uh, what, what, what happens when a person dies. Is there life after death or, or what's going to happen? So the Apostle Paul and uh, the other helpers, they taught him. So now the Apostle Paul in chapter 5, okay, chapter 5, he reminds them, hey, for you know very well, we have already told you, we taught you, you know very well. And I'm pretty sure that you know very well, maybe not perfectly, like uh, uh, an expert in uh, prophecy, but I'm pretty sure that you know a lot about prophecy, about the things to come, right? right. I'm pretty sure that you know that. So it's telling you, or you know very well, Okay, so, but they don't know that. You talk to an unbeliever about prophecy, and I'm pretty sure that an unbeliever has a hundred questions. <laughs> but what, is it, it is, what do you think? It is, it is, it is. And, and questions that most likely you're going to be able to answer, because you know, you know very well. So that's, and here, the scriptures, they're comparing the knowing by being awake. Okay? So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake. So the Apostle Paul is telling us, look, you got to have a clear picture of yourself. You are a believer. You have the knowledge of the scriptures. Therefore, you are spiritually awake. You should be always, constantly waiting for the coming of, using the analogy, the coming of the thief, so that, so that you won't be surprised. So that you won't be surprised, because Jesus is saying, hey, I will come like a thief. But who's going to be surprised? Those that are asleep. But us, that we are awake, it shouldn't be any surprise. We should be expecting that. Okay? Okay, so that's the first contrast that we acknowledge and ignorance. The second one that we already covered was expectancy and surprise. Expectancy and surprise. And and the same thing is using this comparison. When you are expected, that means that you have the light of the word of God illuminating you, giving you wisdom and understanding of the things of God, while the unbeliever is in complete darkness. That person doesn't have the Word of God, giving him the spiritual light of God. You brothers and sisters are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light. Okay? So you see there, the comparison between light and darkness, expectancy, and surprise. Would you be surprised if Jesus comes today? No. I know that it's going to be so, so fast that it's not going to be time for us to be surprised, you know, in, in that sense that you say, oh, the rapture is coming, huh? I can feel it. No, it's going to be so fast. But the surprise is... When you find yourself face to face with Jesus, you say, oh, I'm not ready to be face to face with Jesus. I'm so ashamed. Oh, I've been really failing the Lord. I haven't been really living 
up to his will for my life. Because the will of God is different for all of us. And you should know the will of God for your life and live up to that uh, standard or, or will of God in your life. Okay? But once we are in the presence of God, that we have a glorified nature, glorified body, then we're going to realize exactly how we failed the Lord, how hypocrite we were, how uh, double-minded we were. Right there, we're going to, so that's why right now we have to do that spiritual battle so that I can be honest with the Lord. I can be straight with the Lord. I can be obedient to the Lord. We know that we, we're not going to be perfect, but the Bible tells us that yes, that we should strive to be every day more like Christ. Is Christ perfect? So that should be our word. We should strive for that. And the, even the Bible uses that word for us. That we should desire to be perfect. Okay? We should desire to be like Jesus. Okay, so now let's look at number three. Okay, this is going to be new material for this message, number three. And um, now in verses six and eight is soberness and drunkenness. Okay? So he's doing this comparison, this comparison between a believer and an unbeliever. And uh, I know that uh, when we see it, not in a spiritual sense, not in a spiritual sense, soberness and drunkenness, we know that more and more and more as time goes by, there is almost no difference between a believer, person that goes to an evangelical church, a Christian church, and an unbeliever in the sense of drinking alcohol. Nowadays, we don't see too much difference. Somebody, a, a, a relative, he sent me a, a video and he said, uh, what do you think about this? Is this acceptable in your church, in your belief? And then I saw that, that video about uh, how Christians are really now living more in grace than, uh, than being like the Pharisees. Uh, and then it shows that Christians are going to Christian discotheques where they have Christian music, okay? They have Christian music and you dance and everything. Uh, you know, but in a Christian environment with Christian music. But at the same time, it says, uh, and we notice that many of the people that come there, they already they already come kind of drunk, or they smoke weed or some kind of drug, and, and they have a, a good Christian fun. Do you agree or disagree? Leave your comments. And most of the people that come, in, they were in favor of that. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. But that's why it's difficult to say when we're not talking about uh, sovereignness and drunkenness spiritually, but physically, uh, the difference is just getting closer and closer and closer. So that's why it is always for us because not be afraid, because I, I told this person, look, I'm not God to decide who's saved and who's not saved, but my opinion is that most of that people are not saved. My opinion, okay? That's my opinion, not mm, the judgment of God, right? because I'm not God, but my opinion. That's what, you know, and, and always don't be afraid to give your opinion so that they can see where you stand biblically, where you stand biblically, that you don't agree with that, okay? even though it's presented like grace, it's coming back to the Christian churches. Because I don't see it like, like something that is grace. But here, the Apostle Paul is telling us the difference, so he tells us, so then, 
Let us not be like others who are also asleep, but let us be awake and sober. See? So he's using it, the comparison of a, a person that drinks alcoholic beverages and that he's not in his right mind with the person that doesn't drink alcoholic beverages and is in his right mind. You see, that's the difference. I, I, I know that for sure. I, when I, when I was not a Christian, when I wanted to be out of my mind, I would drink alcohol. It would make me do things that I wouldn't dare do when I was sober. So that's the idea that the apostle is telling us. Now, it keeps saying in verse 7, For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. That was, in those days, that was the custom in those days. Nowadays, you can find, I remember, when I was not a Christian, that I was a, a, a waiter, a friend of mine, well, a co-worker, okay? He was always drunk. Always drunk. You can smell that he was like a, probably a, already an alcoholic. And he was just a little tequilita. Just a little tequilita. Yeah, that little tequilita is already a bottle. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so nowadays, even during the day, during the day, during any time, you get drunk. Okay? Because now it's very easy to, to get drunk. I remember my uncle. He, he was a, an alcoholic. But the doctor told him, if you keep drinking, you're gonna, your, your liver is it, not going not gonna to stand anymore. More often. So he was oh, not drinking. But one day we went to, to a, a, a boxing match. We went to the stadium and we were there. So, and he was sober. Oh, and he just suddenly turned around. I didn't know him. And he opened a little canaimas bottle, a little one, just a little one like this. One sip. And in a few seconds he was like, uh, uh, what? What happened? <laughs> what a conversion. <laughs> so so that's what the Apostle Paul is telling us about the difference between a believer spiritually, spiritually, we we are um, awake, we are sober, we are in our right mind, while the unbeliever is, is like a drunk person. He's not in his right mind. Because I know even when I was not a, a, a believer, without drugs or without alcohol, without, I was not in my right mind. All my ideas, all my thoughts, all my plans, we're not according to God's will. But now that we are Christians, it should be very different. That's why I even not even think about using alcohol. Like nowadays, they say, well, like in the past, they say, it's legal. You can buy it in the market. So what's wrong? It's legal to drink because it was used to be illegal alcoholic beverages like marijuana it used to be illegal, but now that it's legal, so now Christians are saying it's legal. The same thing, same argument. And little by little, it's uh, keep going, keep going that to the point that nowadays you can go to a Christian wedding and have alcohol. So it's just a, a matter of time that you're going to go to a Christian, Christian wedding and they're going to have wheat. You're going to see. And you're going to see. And nobody's going to be saying, weed? Yeah, it's legal. There's nothing wrong. We're smoking here. Pass it around. Oh, thank you. It's free. Like, like the alcoholic version. You go to a wedding and it's free. You drink free. You're going to smoke free. So 
that's why the, the, the difference that the Bible tells is telling us the Bible Paul between us and the unbelievers. And we should always keep that difference. Amen. Don't let the world suck you into its wall. The Bible tells us in Romans. Just because the world, and you see other Christians that are doing what they're doing, the things of this world, don't do it. Sometimes we have people that have strong influence over us, and, and, and we follow what they say, what they are doing, what they are practicing. And we shouldn't do that. We should always follow just the scriptures, just the Holy Spirit. Not a person, what a person is saying or doing. So I remember this person that told me, oh, oh this brother that, you know, he, he is considered a very spiritual brother. He, he did that. He is doing that. So, like, now I have permission to also do the same thing. There's nothing wrong. But what does the Bible say? It's not what he says. The Bible, what the Bible says. Uh, I don't know, it's not very clear. But let's look it up and let's see if it's clear or if it's not clear. Okay, oh. But we start going with the, with the wind uh, and the Bible tells us, don't, don't do that in, in James, tells us, don't let the wind toss you around. Just be steady with the Word of God. Be steady with the Word of God, only with the Word of God. And here he's telling us. Because in verse 8 it says, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. See, the Apostle Paul, you see, that um, three virtues that we need probably know by memory from 1 Corinthians. Okay? And now remains okay? faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of this is love. Remember that verse? Here he is mentioning it again. Okay? He's telling us. Put on faith. Okay? He's saying, practice, live by faith. You have to, to be different. It has to, it, it has to be very evident that you are not like the unbelievers because you have faith. And remember, what is the uh, the same word, the synonym of faith? It starts with the letter O. Obedience. Obedience. Always remember that. Every time that you see faith. Think about obedience. Because it's the synonym. Okay? Biblically. Faith is the faith equals obedience. Always keep that in mind. Because if you say, Oh, I'm a person of faith, you're saying I'm a person that obeys God. And not, oh, I'm a person of faith. Yeah, I go to a bilingual Baptist church. No, 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 no. It's not about just going to church. It's not just belonging to a church. It's about obeying the Lord. Oh, every day with your, in your mind, with your attitude, your decisions, your behavior, your calendar, your everything. It should show that you are a believer. Okay? That you are a believer. So faith and love, okay, love. When we, as Christians, that we are loving, we, we love the Lord, first of all, we love our neighbor, okay? So when I love my neighbor, I love my wife, I love my children, I love my relatives, I love, I love my family of faith. You see, when we love the, our family of faith, when you love your family of faith, I want you to be honest. Do you think it's going to be easy for you just to leave the church? When you love that family of faith, when you love, see that word agape, unconditionally, that you're not expecting perfection, 
on them. That you love like Jesus loves you. In the same way you love the family of faith. Do you think it's going to be very easy for you to leave? No. But you see, I have seen it. I've been here for more than 30 years as a pastor and 10 years as a, as a, as a member. And I have seen it. See, as a pastor, it's very, it hurts a lot when I see people that, that you see, God used me to bring them to the knowledge of Christ. And then, God, I was able to officiate their marriage and uh, to see their, their kids and baptize them, baptize their kids. And, all, and suddenly, they just disappear without even saying, bye, pastor. Not even that. Do you think that's love for God's family when that happens? So you, so you need to think about that, okay? Think about that because we should really live the real Christian life, not just the religious Christian life, but the real Christian life, love hope of salvation. Hope of salvation, you see, the word hope in the Bible is not the way that we use it here. I hope I could have a mansion. Most likely it's not going to happen. <laughs> you see? But the, the way that is understood in the Bible, hope is an assurance. That you have the assurance of your salvation. And you're just waiting for that to be realized. Because we know that uh, salvation is past, present, and future. I was saved. How many years ago I was saved? Before Christ. <laughs> Long ago I was saved. Okay? And every day I've been saved from Satan's temptation, Satan's attack, the attack of my flesh, the attack of this world, all the enemies. That's why the Lord continues to be my Savior, because I need constant salvation. And then salvation in the future is when completely we're going to get rid of this sinful nature, and we're going to save fully, and we're going to be like Christ in his resurrection. You see? So that's the hope of salvation, that we have that expectation of that glorious day when I'm going to experience glorification. Glorification. So here the Apostle Paul is telling us there, there's a big, big difference between you believers and unbelievers. That's why you should be sober and, and not be like the world in drunkenness. In, in drunkenness. It's like they are being like asleep. And, and that's what happens when, when people get drunk. I remember when I was not a Christian, I was in Juarez. We used to get together, me and two other good friends, and we would always go out. But one of them, he would always drink too much, and at the end we had to carry him because he was asleep. And we already knew where to find him. In the restroom, we were like, asleep. <laughs> and we were like, hey, hey, come on, it's time to go home. Oh, no, no, leave me, leave me. And he was very comfortable sleeping there. So that's the idea that the apostle is saying, that we are very different. We're not like that anymore. We are sober. We are in our right mind. Always keep that in mind, that we are in the right mind because we have the Word of God. We are enlightened with the Word of God. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit in us. Do you truly believe that the Holy Spirit lives in you? The third person of the Trinity lives in you? Are you aware? Do you truly believe that? Okay. That's why the Apostle Paul, speaking in that same way with, to the Romans, he says, The night is far gone. The day of his return will soon be here. So quit 
the evil deeds of darkness and put on the armor of right living as we who live in the daylight should. Okay? And then verse 13. Be decent and true in everything you do so that all can approve of your behavior. Don't spend your time in wild parties and getting drunk or in adultery and lust or fighting or jealousy. So that is applicable for us Christians. He's telling us, be like this and don't be like that. You see the comparison that he's giving us? Be like this. Have a good testimony. And don't work on having a bad testimony that people might say, a Christian? Forget it. If, that, if that's being a Christian, I'm a Christian too. Because we do the same things and I think he's even crazier than me. I have heard that. I have heard that. Okay. So... That's what the Bible tells us, that we are very different, okay? And because believers had been delivered from the domain of darkness, the Bible tells us that we were transported from the dominion of darkness, to the domain of darkness, to, to the light of Christ, okay? We are taking out of the night of sin and ignorance and put into the light of God. So it's a big difference, okay? It is a big difference. And we should live up to that standard that is God's standard. We are not to live like those that are sleeping, drunken people who will be jolted out of their coma by the day of the Lord. Okay? But we should live alert, spiritually alert. Okay? Always expecting that my Lord can come today and I want to be ready. If he comes today, it's going to be a glorious day for me to have that reunion with him and not, oh no, don't come. You see, that's why at the end of, of uh, the book of Revelation, the apostle John, you know, he was in desire, oh Lord, come, yes, I wish, I desire for you to come. Okay? Because he just had a revelation of the terrible judgment upon the earth and a vision of heaven. So he said, oh no, I, uh, I, don't, I don't want the things of this world, Lord, just come, come. Do you have that desire for Jesus to come any moment and you're ready? Or you're saying, no, 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 not, I'm not ready yet, Lord. You know, you know, I haven't really been living the Christian life. I've been uh, witchy-watchy here and there. Be ready, okay? Because Christians are in the light. We should not sleep as spiritual indifference and comfort because usually that's the, the, the problem, indifference, okay? We hear the Word of God and we get entertained with the message, we like it, but then comes indifference on Monday to Friday, it's an indifference that... And indifference means that you know, the impact that I received the moment that I was exposed to the Word of God, now it doesn't have any effect on me. It doesn't have any effect on me. Why? Because I prefer comfort. See? Comfort is going to lead to indifference. Because when you think about, okay, now, now I'm going to really do God's will, but that's going to take me out of my comfort zone. And then comes the compare, the, the, the battle. What should I do? Uh, do God's will or remain in my comfort zone? Oh, doing God's will is going to get me out of my comfort zone. And it's good. I'm going to have to make some sacrifices of this, that, uh, uh, Indifference. Now it's going to lead to indifference. See? So we have to be careful. And like it says there, because Christians are in the light, 
they should not sleep in spiritual endeavor and comfort, but be alert to the spiritual issues around them. Are you alert on the spiritual issues? Do you understand what's going on in the news, in life, in the United States, in the world? Do you really connect that to prophecy, to the Word of God? See, once again, I, I, let me remind you about the messages that, that we went about socialism, about globalism, about pandemics, about economic chaos, the, the falling away, the end times people, the uh, cancel culture, spiritual famine, and Israel and Jerusalem, all, all that is happening around us. Do you see the connection with prophecy? Do you see how that relates to the Word of God? Or not? Or not? Sometimes we allow to shape our mind, Univision, uh, and the news, NBC, CBS, uh, and that's what shapes our mind. What they, because they're not telling you the news; they are giving you their their view about the news. They are commenting the news. They're not reporting. They're not reporting. They're brainwashing in a way. And we have to be careful. That's why it's better to, to let the Word of God brainwash you because that's going to be a good clean wash. Not, not the other one. Okay? So number four. Number four. Number four. Comparison that it, it here from verses 9 through 11. Salvation and judgment. Okay? Salvation and judgment. Are you appointed for salvation or for judgment? Hmm? Are you appointed for salvation or judgment? I want to hear from you. What do you think is going to be your future? Salvation or judgment? If you're a true, if you're a true believer, you know that you're going to say salvation, not judgment. Because look what the Bible says in verse 9. For God has not chosen to pour out his righteous judgment upon us, but to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see? You see why we believe that the rapture is going to be before the tribulation? Because there are many passages where it says that we are not appointed to judgment. That we're not going to go through God's judgment that he's going to bring upon this earth. Okay? So therefore, we have to understand that the rapture is going to be first and then it's going to come the judgment upon this world. Upon this world. But that's something that we should know. The, the difference between me and an unbeliever. I know, I know that I've been chosen for salvation. I know that I've been chosen to experience the rapture, the glorification, and the unbeliever. Do you think he knows that? Do you think he believes that? Not even believe that if you explain to them, most likely many uh, unbelievers are going to laugh at the teaching of the raptures. That's why many Christians nowadays, they don't dare speak about the rapture with a friend, with a relative, and, and talk about the rapture because they mm, no, that subject uh, is kind of like, uh, huh. no, not like that. I'm not going to do that. Why not? Is the next event in history. And here the Apostle Paul is using it for building up. He's using it for, for evangelism, for salvation. So we should see the power of the Word of God. The power of knowing what's coming so that people can have the fear of God and lead them to salvation. We should always 
That's why in Revelations, the Apostle John, he says, because you have patiently obeyed me despite the persecution, therefore I will protect you from the time of great tribulation and temptation which will come upon the world to test everyone. Maybe for all we say, oh, despite the persecution, no, we, don't, we don't experience persecution here. And especially if we are not witnessing, there will be no persecution because that's the only way that we're going to experience that level, the low level of persecution when we are witnessing. And that's going to be the kind of persecution that they're going to criticize you. They're going to say things like, oh, it's a fanatic, it's this or that. That's the kind of persecution that we can experience here. In other parts of the world, there is real persecution. Real persecution. And they remain faithful. Even though they know that it can cost his or her life, they remain faithful. They remain faithful. And he says, I will protect you from the time of great tribulation. Okay? From the great tribulation, he's going to, to protect his people, okay? true believers. Okay? And then in verse 10, it says, And they speak of how you are looking forward. That's verse 10 of chapter 1. And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. Okay. So you see, in this section, verses 9 to 11, the Apostle Paul is giving that comparison, that contrast. Okay, we are going to experience complete salvation, full salvation, perfect salvation, and the unbelievers is going to experience the righteous judgment of God. The righteous judgment is not going to be unfair. Righteous means God is not going to be unfair. It's going to be the fair judgment of God upon sinners. Okay? So he's telling us it's a big difference, okay? And now the Apostle Paul is telling the Thessalonians, you see, now this is, it's got to be your position, okay? It's got to be your position. He died for us so that we can live for, for him, okay? Now, uh, let me finish with these three statements that we can summarize what we just uh, learned. Christ died for us that we might live through him. That's the only way that, that we can be saved. Through him. God showed how much he loved us by sending his only son into the wicked world to bring us eternal life through his death. Okay? Through his death. So that's the only way that we can be saved. Through Jesus Christ. Only through Jesus Christ. But Christ died for us that we might live for Him. Okay? Now, I used to live for me. But in my new life, in Christ, my conversion, my new birth, now I should live for Christ. He said, He died for everyone so that those who receive His new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. For them. Now, if you say that you found salvation through Him, now ask yourself, am I living for Him? Am I living for Him? Because that was the purpose of salvation, to live for Him, not to continue living for yourself. Not for yourself, no, but to live for Christ. And, you see, once you see that these two points are a reality, then yes, 
I live through Jesus, through his death. Now I'm alive. And that's why I live for him. Now the third one, Christ died for us that we might live with him. Might live with him. It says there, he died for us so that we can live with him forever. Whether we are dead or alive at the time of his return. In verse 10, in that passage in 1 Thessalonians 5, that's what it's telling us. That now, live with him. Live with him. Okay? So, that's the comparison. That's the comparison here. It's the contrast between them. Knowledge and ignorance, expectancy and surprise, soberness, drunkenness, salvation, and judgment. Okay? What is your side? The red or the orange? Let's pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word that is very clear and we have teachings, warnings, promises, everything that is needed for this life. We know that the only thing that we need is faith and that means obedience to really have that living kind of faith that shows in obedience. So Lord, we know that you have shown us each one of us here where we are failing in our relationship with you. Lord, that we may take it seriously and really during the week and during our lifetime work on on improving and becoming more like Jesus because we know that one day we're going to be face to face with you and we want to be fully ready for that. So we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy and, and your Holy Spirit that lives in us. We thank you, Lord. And we pray in Jesus' name and for his honor and glory only. Amen. Amen. Okay.